So I'm here to talk to you today about an epidemic, an epidemic that is affecting millions of us and I'm sure affects many of us in this room. And it may well be the cause of the root of the problems that we face in the world today. Now, individually, each of us is a microcosm of the macrocosm. And our individual struggles that play out in our daily life are mirrored in the external conflicts we see in the world around us. We spend billions of dollars and an immense amount of energy trying to fix the problems of the world. But it is impossible to fix any problem until we address the root cause of the problem. Now Einstein said, to solve a problem, you cannot use the same level of consciousness that the problem was created from. So to actually change the world, affect real change, it's going to take something from each and every one of us. A shift in our own consciousness to look at the parts inside ourselves that we harbor indifference, conflict, and hatred. Now, on a local level, our personal relationships with our family, our friends, and our coworkers. Now, when those are out of sync and we have conflict, it actually creates a ripple effect that produces a storm surge of conflict, hatred, jealousy, bitterness, and it floods our world. What are we going to do about that? We all have relationships that we care deeply about. And healthy relationships require love and care and compassion. But what about your relationship with the most important person in your life, the person that you have a relationship with from birth to death, 24-7, yourself? Have you ever considered the relationship you have with yourself? I'm just wondering if anyone here is, if you even knew that you had a relationship with yourself. Because I didn't realize I had a relationship with myself until about 13 years ago. I was at a retreat. And a participant walked up to me, and she was crying. And she said, I just realized I've been living with an emotional abuser. And I was surprised. She was a confident, successful businesswoman. And she looked like she had it all. And I asked her, who is this emotional abuser? And she said, it's me. I'm the emotional abuser. She went on to explain to me that she had been abusing herself through her negative self-talk. She referred to it as emotional violence that the negative self-talk she had was actually emotional violence. Her words hit me right in my heart, and I had this aha moment that I, too, was living with an emotional abuser, and I was the culprit. Until that moment, I believed every thought I had, every judgment, and it didn't even occur to me that perhaps these thoughts weren't true. I wanted to talk to you today about your relationship with yourself. Now. One thing I did was I actually took a week of my time and I decided to investigate this negative self-talk. So what I did was I wrote down every time I noticed a judgment, a criticism, blaming, either of myself or someone else. Now the list got pretty long. At the end of the week, I looked at the list, I read it, and I said, would I be friends with someone who spoke to me in the way that my thoughts are speaking to me? And you guys know the answer to this. Absolutely not. So why would I tolerate it from me? This is when I realized I had to be stopped. And I was the only one who could stop me. So this is when I committed myself to my relationship with myself. And that meant courageously looking at every aspect of myself and deciding how I wanted to show up in my life. We're always talking about that we need to commit to a relationship. We need to commit to our marriage. Well, we need to commit to ourselves and look at our own relationship because no other relationship can really be successful until we have a good relationship with ourselves. The Buddha said, you yourself, as much as anyone, deserve your love and affection. One day I was listening to a Buddhist monk. And someone asked him if world peace was attainable. He said, the conflict is not outside us. The conflict is within us. Peace begins inside of you, and war begins inside of you. 
So two questions arose for me. Number one, how can we have world peace if we can't attain inner peace? Number two, what is this internal conflict we have that keeps us from living peace? Now, the internal conflict goes by many names, and you've all heard them. Monkey mind, ego, gremlins, stinking thinking, pain body. But it all comes down to the same thing. It's the habitual negative thoughts that are going on in our head. So until we really look at those, we really can't live a life of happiness and peace. It's almost like there's a committee inside our head. There's a judge, there's a jury, there's a defender, there's a victim, there's an accuser, and they're all vying for your attention. And until you take control over this committee, it's going to keep doing what it wants. Now, the, com the committee has many opinions, and it tends to look at your life in terms of success and failure. And it attempts to gain approval. I'm sure a lot of you can relate to striving to gain other people's approval. Like, how do you feel if someone doesn't like your new haircut? They don't like your outfit, or they don't like you. What happens is that we begin to be like the chameleon. We alter our behavior to seek other people's approval. Now, of course, it's nice to receive kind words from people and compliments. We all love that. But when we're seeking approval, what we're doing is we're disempowering ourselves by handing over the keys to our happiness to someone else. So we're looking outside ourselves. To have a healthy and loving relationship with yourself, you need to approve and accept yourself first. Now this voice, it compares you to others. And we all know how this is. Sometimes you feel superior. You feel like you're smarter, you're better than this other person. But the tide can quickly turn and suddenly you feel inferior, not as good. So what's happening is we're actually on our own emotional seesaw. One minute we're up, the next minute we're down. And we're constantly going up and down. I wanted to share a life-changing moment that happened for me. Um, it was many years ago after I completed writing my first book. And I consider myself a recovering, <laughs> recovering perfectionist. And so if there's any perfectionists out there, you know what I'm talking about. When I painstakingly tortured myself for two years over this book because it had to be perfect. Well, the day I had been waiting for finally arrived and the books were delivered to my home. It was the first time I was seeing my book. So I was on top of my emotional seesaw with excitement. And you guys probably already know this does not end well. <laughs> As I started flipping through the book, and it was like, oh my god, I did a horrible job. That negative thinking just started. And it was like I was judging and criticizing my book. The moment I'd been waiting for was full of disappointment. And I plummeted down to the bottom of my emotional <laughs> seesaw. And um, I was judging the book as not being good enough. But on a deeper level, I was actually judging myself as not being good enough. And this was a massive wake-up call for me. Because my whole life, I dreamed about writing and photographing this book. And when I saw that the happy did, happiness did not come with the completion of this book, I was just, I remember sitting there like it was yesterday. And I knew that I really had to take a deep look inside myself. And I learned a couple things. The first thing I learned was I was looking at my book from this, this filter this fear-based filter of the perfectionist voice that was constantly fault-finding. And we're all, we all have filters. And when we're looking at life through these filters, if the filters come from fear, everything we see is distorted. But we're so used to looking at life that way, we don't even realize that our vision is distorted. And the second thing I learned was I had an expectation that I wasn't aware of. And the expectation was that somehow this accomplishment would prove that I was valuable. It would take away all my self-doubt, and then I would be happy. Because that's what I really wanted, was to be happy. Now, studies show that among all cultures, what most people want is to be happy. But so often we are looking outside ourselves for our happiness a new relationship, a bigger business, bettering our physical appearance, 
or your new book, or I love this one, if only your partner would change and be the way you want him or her to be, then you could be happy. So once again, we are back on our emotional seesaw. We're going up and down. But there's good news. There is a space between the up and the down of the seesaw when it is equally balanced, right in the middle. And that is when the internal noise and the outer noise disappear. And that is when we can hear ourselves. That's when we're in our stillness. And that is when we connect to the deepest level of our being. And we feel the power of our presence. And that is where we connect to the energy of love and compassion and gratitude and patience and kindness and equality and unity. That is when we connect to the deepest level of our own selves. And we're always looking out there for it. But it's right here within you, right now in this moment. You can access that part of you. It is always there for you. It's just a matter of stopping this voice. And what I realized is this voice is only a habit. And it only has the power that I choose to give it. Now, neuroscientists have proven that habits are worn into our brain, and they create familiar neural pathways. And that is why it is so difficult to break a habit. It's like the horse, you've heard this story, that travels down the same path for several years. Given the choice to go to another path, the horse will automatically go to the path he's been traveling for all these years. Well, our brains work in the same way. In a sense, we are on autopilot too. That is, until we wake up and ask, what am I thinking? The most important question that I've realized I can ask myself and share it with you is to ask, how are you relating to yourself? Is it from the empowering energy of positivity, love, and compassion? Or is it the disempowering energy of negativity, fear, and dissatisfaction? Or both? Now, I was speaking to a neuroscientist at MIT, and we were talking about the brain. And he said, you know, the Buddha wrote about this over 2,500 years ago. And what the Buddha said was, the thought becomes the word. The word manifests as the deed. The deed develops into a habit, and the habit hardens into character. So watch the thought and its ways with care, and let it spring from love out of concern for all beings. As the shadow follows the body, as we think, so we become. So how do we stop this ap epidemic? We save ourselves first by caring and loving and having compassion for ourselves. And as we care for ourselves, we naturally care and love for others. And that will create a ripple effect that will produce a storm surge of love, compassion, joy, happiness that will flood the entire world. So I want to ask you today, how are you relating to yourself? Is it from the energy of love or is it from the energy of negativity and fear? Thank you.